Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Welcome, Walter. Hi, Martin. We're back to do part two of yes. the Gospel of John. Yeah, why are we talking about the Gospel of John? Well, we spoke about it last time because it has a very particular message about uh, the divinity of Christ, mm -hmm. the centrality of the Gospel, and a special message for those that will receive the outpouring of the rain as a type of the latter rain. Yes. Yeah. So it's a very important message. So let's open with a word of prayer. Yes, then that'll we can get be right wonderful. Into it. Our Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for everything that you do for us. Thank you for bringing us together again and also for enabling us to have these discussions. Will you bless this discussion? Enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Martin, John played such a pivotal role. He was, as we said many times, the son of thunder. Mm -hmm. And then he became this meek but firm, as a rock to principle, disciple. And uh, I don't think it's coincidental that the Lord gave him the revelation no, on the Isle of Patmos. Mm -hmm to link the New Testament prophecies to the Old Testament prophecies. And you know, Martin, when I looked at uh, Daniel and I read in selected messages, I found it very interesting that there was another perspective to this last verse in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, where God says... Uh, what would happen at the end. So he gives a time prophecy from verse 10 onwards, 11 and 12, and then he says, But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest, that means he will be put to sleep, and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Now, the way I always interpret it is that uh, there will be a resurrection, and I think that's correct. There yeah. will be a resurrection. But there's another application that I missed. He will stand in his lot or in his place mm -hmm. in the latter days. Now, that's very interesting because wow. that means he will fulfill a prophetic position in the last days. Yeah. Because remember that there was a portion of the book of Daniel, the 2,300-day prophecy that was sealed unto the time yeah. of the end. So actually the book will also be standing in the its place. The book will be standing in its place. And then I read in selected messages, and I found this so fascinating. You know, the Bible is a marvelous book, and the spirit of prophecy is such a wonderful help. I'm reading it from page 109 in Selected Messages, book 2. And it says, All that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been, and all that is yet to come in its order will be. Mm -hmm. Daniel, God's prophet, stands in his place. That's in his lot. Yeah. John stands in his place. In the Revelation, the Lion of the tribe of Judah has opened to the students of prophecy the book of Daniel, and thus Daniel standing in his place. He bears his testimony, that which the Lord revealed to him in vision of the great and solemn events which we must know as we stand on the very threshold of their fulfillment. So here he stands in his place. In other words, he fulfills a prophetic mm -hmm. profile. And John and Daniel are to be linked together. Yeah. Now the Gospel of John tells the story of Jesus in a totally different way to the other three Gospels, the mm -hmm. Synoptic Gospels, and we discussed that last time. And then it has this information for God's people that are going to be faced with a crisis. Yes. And then you have 
the epistles that John wrote, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and then the book of Revelation, which links it all together. And it's fascinating to me that when you study it and you study the spirit of prophecy with it, it tells you quite clearly that the events that are foretold for the time that we are living in have to do with the authority of God and the law of God. Yes. Now, we spoke last time about the order mm -hmm. the of the books and that the law would be far more prominent if the order had been retained. Now, the law of God, of course, is the basis of his government. Mm -hmm. And the Sabbath is the symbol of his authority mm -hmm. to wield that authority and to implement or to make it the basis of his government. And the devil is opposed to it. And he has an agent. And as these messages were unfolded, the first, second, and third angels' messages, as they unfolded in their time from 1843 to 1844 and onwards, they were enlightened by the Spirit of God and the whole conflict mm. that was really highlighted in the Reformation comes to its culmination in the book of Revelation. And we know what the enemy of God is doing to get rid of the basis of his government, the law. Yes. And in John's time, you, you must also put it in perspective, the Sabbath wasn't under attack. No. Because they were all, the Christians and the Jews, were still keeping their real Sabbath. Yes. So he didn't even know when he was in Revelation giving it that this authority will be attacked. Yes. That it was going to be about the Sabbath end. Actually. Yes. And the interesting thing is if you, if you relate it back to the duty of God's people in the end and why it's important that we understand these things, then we must turn to Isaiah chapter 58. Because this relates this, the duty of God's people. Mm. So Isaiah chapter 58 talks about a people that will restore the old waste places. And uh, it talks about the fast that God requires that changes the heart. And verse 7 it says, or in verse 6 actually, is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? That is the purpose of evangelism. Yeah. That's the purpose of it. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? Now, this is very important because we're going to talk about the Gospel of John mm -hmm. and we will discuss certain issues there where the bread becomes very important in a spiritual sense. So if we read this spiritually, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? And that thou bring the poor that are cast out of thy house, when thou seest the naked that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. This is not only in a physical sense. Mm. This is a spiritual. spiritual sense. In other words, the naked are those that are devoid of the righteousness of Christ. Yes. and Those, those that are hungry are those that are not being fed with the truths of the gospel. Of the word, yeah. And the interesting thing is, it says, many of them were cast out of thy house. In other words, God's own people trampled on his possession mm. and made their lives a misery. And there will be a gathering time and God will set the records. And bring straight. them back into the house. Bring them back. That's interesting. Um, again, in the previous one, we also mentioned, they're coming into the house. So nobody's leaving the house. Yes. So if you are saying you must leave yes. because the house has become Babylon. Well, the house was corrupt because many were cast out of the house mm -hmm. and many have been trampled upon. But God will gather them again. He'll bring them back into the house. And then verse 8, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning and thine health shall spring forth speedily. 
and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward. This is such a wonderful promise. In other words, you'll be surrounded by the righteousness of Christ. And he will go before you and he will be behind you. He will hit you in. Then shalt thou call and the Lord shall answer and shall cry and he shall say, I am here. Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. You know, people place yokes on, on other people by constantly criticizing. Uh, this is just the nature of humanity, it seems. And place burdens upon them that God never required. Mm. And, you know, one of the great burdens that the Jewish nation placed upon its own people were the exacting rules and regulations, particularly with regards to the Sabbath. That's true. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. What a beautiful promise. So no self-centered religion can be placed into this setting. So how? what was the character of the leadership like? that God had to make a statement like that. They were mm. boastful and proud and full of themselves, probably. And then this beautiful promise in verse 11, And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee, shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Martin, who is he talking about here? He's talking about the remnant that will come out there. Yes, because this is, this is reminiscent of Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Come out of her, my people. The remnant that will remain. And they that shall be of thee, mm -hmm. those that come forth out of this truth, they shall build the old waste places. In other words, many a truth has been buried in the rubble. It's a wasted place. Yeah. It has to be repaired. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. So, Martin, even the foundation has been destroyed. Mm. Now, what is the foundation? I will put enmity between thee and the woman. That was the first gospel message ever preached. And uh, this gospel message, this everlasting gospel, must be restored. Now, the interesting thing is, the Christian world today has rejected the law of God. They pay it lip service sometimes, but they have basically made it null and void, right? Yes. Okay. But if the law is the basis of God's government, then it cannot be made null and void, and it cannot be divorced from the gospel. Yeah. Because if you divorce the law from the gospel, then there is no need for Christ to die. That's exactly it. And like we've said before as well, the fact that he died proves that the law stands. So you cannot divorce the law. It's the basis of everything. It's because the law was transgressed. That death came into the world that a savior was required. Mm -hmm. So we have to restore those old waste places and build up that foundation from the ground up. Many generations... So it's not only this generation that has lost the plot. They lost the plot throughout history because there's an adversary. And then this, this people, they shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorers of paths to dwell in. Now, a breach, a breach was in the wall. Mm. Now, the wall always stood for the law, yeah. the wall of protection. There was a breach in it. 
And then it has to give us some details as to what that breach was, right? And verse 13 is actually in the original, a new paragraph. So let's read this. This is very important. If thy, thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. Uh, what is the Lord's day? Sabbath. So how can the Christian world claim that when John speaks about being in vision on the Lord's day that that was Sunday? It's incomprehensible. It's incomprehensible, and it actually means that a little bit of a lack of study. Because if you study this, you cannot go wrong. With you it. cannot go wrong. This is the only definition of what the Lord's day is, because he says, my holy day. It's not our day. People always say, you keep your Sabbath and I'll keep mine. And I say, no, no, no. I keep the Lord's Sabbath. You are keeping a human Sabbath. And call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Is it important, the Sabbath? Pivotal. Pivotal, right? So uh, it's just a question of a day, Martin. No, no, no. There's a much, much deeper meaning, you right? Know, you know, everything hangs on it. Authority. Everything. Uh, let me just read that first section again. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath. Now, what do you do with your foot? Don't you trample under foot? Yeah. So in other words, the the Sabbath will be trampled underfoot. Mm -hmm. And if you stop doing that, yeah. stop trampling my Sabbath underfoot, then what will be the consequences? Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. Now, the heritage of Jacob, thy father, is eternal life. Yeah. Hmm? That's it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So, Martin, can we divorce the law, and particularly the Sabbath, from no. the end time message? Actually, the Sabbath will re-emphasize the importance of keeping the whole law. All right. And it also emphasizes the relationship. It is the breach in the wall because it attacks the authority authority of God and attacks the basis of his government. Jesus said in the Old Testament in prophetic terms, I delight to do thy will. So this is this is a very pivotal section. It's also very pivotal, the delight. Because how many people say it's a burden, the Sabbath? Aha. Uh -huh. Now let's just look at that one. Now Jesus, did he make Sabbath issues prominent in his ministry. Definitely. Like we've mentioned, the pool of Bethesda. All of those miracles, those seven miracles, Sabbath miracles, and, and they incensed the Jews. Mm. But here it says quite plainly, you must call the Sabbath a delight. Mm. Now the one who was healed, the one who was loosened from this yoke of bondage, was he joyful on that day? He leaped. He leaped, right? Yeah. Who was miserable? The, <laughs> <laughs> the people that were, that were keeping Sabbath. <laughs> All right. Now, but let's on, put the, that, uh, uh, on their terms. Let's put it in a modern context. If you delight yourself in the Sabbath today, who is miserable? <laughs> the rest of the Christian world. The rest of the Christian world is miserable. Nothing has changed. Yeah. Nothing has changed. So we cannot divorce this from our study of what John has to say. Mm -hmm. Right? So we need to understand, we need to understand that John is not only lifting up Christ in the stories that he tells, he is lifting up the law, he's lifting up the Sabbath. By relating what Christ did on those particular days, loosening the yoke, mm -hmm. and how he rebuked those Pharisees and say, just think about it. This woman 
who has been suffering all these years and you don't want to release her from this yoke on the Sabbath day? Unbelievable, right? So you can have a right concept of the Sabbath. You can have a wrong concept of the Sabbath. You can have a right understanding of what true religion is and you can have a wrong understanding. You can have a a liberating view and you can have a yoke view. Mm. It's been like that all along. So that brings us now to our further study. Now last time we also had this quote. Uh, so let's just put this quote there again. It comes from the Review and Herald, June 18, 1901. The will of God in regard to his people is plainly expressed in the 6th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th chapters of John. The chapters after that deal with the events of the crucifixion. But the instruction to God's people, to that group that was to receive the former reign, we find it in these chapters. We need to understand the 6th, the 13th, the 14th, the 15th, the 16th, and the 17th chapter of John. Yeah. This so, was when Judas was already gone, like you've mentioned. Yes, so this, he leaves in the 13th chapter. Yeah. So this is like you mentioned, this is for the disciples or for the end time people only. Correct. So Martin, this is what we want to do in this study. We want to go through the 6th, the 13th, the 14th, the 15th, the 16th, and the 17th chapter of John and see what instruction there is for God's people. And this is the divine antidote for the sin of the whole world, which is contained in the Gospel of John. That's a powerful statement, right? So is it important that we study it? Well, it's the antidote. It's the antidote. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, Christ declared, has entered life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He may die as Christ died. But the life of the Savior is in him. His life is hid with Christ in God. I am come that they may have life, Jesus said, and that they may have it more abundantly. He carries on the great process by which believers are made one with him in this present life to be one with him throughout all eternity. So let's turn to the Gospel of John and go to chapter 6. We came up to chapter five last time now why is chapter six so important well we just read what the task of god's people is mm -hmm. at the end of time it's to feed the hungry bread, yeah. and to share the bread right so we need to understand what is meant when we are to share the bread mm. so after these things jesus went over the sea of galilee which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, just think in terms of the gospel message. Come buy yes. without price, without money. Come buy bread and wine. So we are dealing here with a gospel message. So he's actually testing Philip. He's saying to Philip, where will we get bread for all of these people? And of course, they're thinking uh, <laughs> literally. <laughs> literally. And Jesus is thinking spiritually. He wants to, to give them a message. So it tells us, this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. 
Philip answered, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. Now, a penny was a day's wages. So 200 days wages is not enough to feed these people. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they amongst so many? There's a lot of symbolism in the barley loaves and the two small fishes. Now, barley was the early harvest. Wheat was the late, late harvest. So when it speaks about barley loaves, we're talking about the early the rain. rain. Mm -hmm. So there are five barley loaves. Five is the number of humanity, as we said, five senses. And then there are two small fishes. Now, a fish was the the symbol of humanity that would be caught by the net, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Now, there are, are two small fishes. Now, why two small fishes? The interesting thing is, what is catching them? The gospel. The gospel is catching mm -hmm. them. And where is the gospel written? Old and New Testament. Old and the New Testament. <laughs> so that's two portions, yeah. right? So people look at this and they want to make literal arguments about whether it's right to eat fish or not. This is ridiculous. It's, We're dealing with a spiritual is, issue here. It's not a diet plan. <laughs> no, it's not a dietary plan here. So we're dealing with barley mm. loaves. We're dealing with the outpouring of the former rain. And what is applicable to the former rain must also be mm -hmm. applicable to the latter rain. So I've got five here. That's enough for all of humanity. And there are two small fishes here. There are two uh, things that have been brought into this gospel. So let's talk about God's word. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. And there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in numbers, about 5,000. Again, you have the number five. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to his disciples and the disciples to them that were sat down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Interesting, right? Yeah. There's always a little twist there. I love the way this, these things are written. Okay, so it, here is a principle in verse 11. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to whom? To the Every, disciples. Yes, and they to the... Okay, so how does this work, Martin? So when it comes to dealing out the spiritual bread, Jesus will give you what you need, if you do the necessary preparation, and then it is your duty to pass it on. Yeah. Okay. That is the, the line of demarcation. So, number one, Jesus takes the loaves, the bread. He gives thanks. He distributes to the disciples. The disciples to them which sat down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Mm. So you could take less or you could take more, right? As much as they would. A choice. You have a choice. And when they were filled, he said unto the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. That's important, right? Nothing may be lost. If you put it into this spiritual, you, you can get so much more. Then you understand what he means. Okay, so something might be thrown down. Hmm. But nothing will be lost. No. Nothing. You, the, God, the word of God will not return empty. No. And I think of these stories that are often read where you know, people get angry and there was a story about uh, a man in, I think it was South America, who was angry with the Bible and he tore it up and he threw it into the river. 
and downstream someone was catching fish and he saw it and he picked up one leaf after the other. <laughs> and he put it together again. Yeah. So nothing, nothing was lost. lost. <laughs> nothing was lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets. How many disciples were there? 12. 12. 12 around one. Mm. All right. So there was enough for each of them to have a basket to distribute. With the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. So the people saw this miracle, said, this must be the Messiah, we'll make him king. Mm. Again, they had a wrong concept, right? They wanted a solution to their immediate problem, mm. but they didn't necessarily want a solution to the soul problem. It's very much where we are today again. People want an earthly savior for an earthly kingdom. They want an earthly kingdom. It's interesting, Martin, that the very next story, we don't have to read it all, is uh, a very interesting one because here he is walking on the sea because they left in their boats and uh, a great wind blew and there was a storm upon the water and then Jesus came walking upon the sea. So he's the master of the sea, and he's the one that can calm the sea. But this is, a, this is a spiritual story of the storms that will rage amongst humanity because the waters stand for the peoples, the multitudes, the nations. And here is one that is above the storm. He walks across the water. And then there's another little miracle here. When Jesus said, it is I, they willingly received him, it says in verse 21, into the ship, and immediately the ship was at land whither they went. Here's another miracle, right? There were a number of those miracles. Yeah. Instant transportation. Yeah. How did we get here? And uh, God will perform miracles. Mm -hmm to help us to spread the gospel to wherever it is needed. The next day, Martin, he again meets up with the people that were involved in this great miracle of the bread. And uh, they came to seek for him. And he said, you know, you come to seek me because you were filled mm. with physical bread. And uh, there are many so-called loaves and fishes Christians who are there for the temporal advantages. But the deeper meaning often escapes them. And so now we need to understand what Jesus has to say to them. They say to them, how did you come here? Where did you come from, etc.? And Jesus said, verse 26, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat, for the food, which perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him has God the Father sealed. Interesting, right? Then they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Is that an important question? Definitely. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. So if you believe in Christ, then you will be empowered to do the works of God because then you will want to be transformed, right? Mm -hmm. And what is the work of God? works of God. It is to hand out the bread to the other people. Why did Jesus come to this world? To seek this and save the lost, yeah. right? And uh, he shares that because he hands it 
to the disciples, and the disciples are supposed to hand it to the other people. It's amazing that they then ask him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? They, <laughs> it's amazing. He just, just the previous day showed them physically, and now they don't understand it. All right. Now, here is the crux of the matter. They say to him, Our fathers did eat manna, in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Mm -hmm. And now comes the spiritual application. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he, mm -hmm. not it. He, it is a person. The bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So the gospel is personified. It is in a person. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. Those are two powerful promises. Now, if you were to take them literally, then you would be disappointed, right? Mm. Because there will be times when you will be hungry, and there will be times when you will be thirsty. But this spiritual food and spiritual drink is for all eternity. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. That's an amazing promise. In other words, seek and you will find. Yeah. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again in, at the last day. So all that come to Christ mm -hmm. with penitent hearts and hunger and thirst shall be filled, and they shall be filled with a he, not with a it, and they will be raised up at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So how does this work? Believe. That means by faith. Mm -hmm. So righteousness is by faith, but yes. that wasn't acceptable to them. No. They wanted righteousness by works. works. But now they asked him, what are your works? And they receive an answer that they don't like. Because the answer is you have to believe. <laughs> <laughs> they want to hear something that they must do. Correct. Just give me a recipe and I'll bake the cake. Yeah. But they don't get a recipe. You have to believe. Now, this, this believing, of course, doesn't mean that you don't have to obey the world. Because Jesus himself said... I came to do the will of him who sent me. You see, if you put the faith in the right position, then the other will follow. Absolutely the follow the correct. So what did they do when he said this? This is amazing. So faith, in other words, doesn't negate works. But as you said, they must be in the right sequence, right? And they are ensconced in an individual mm. who is Christ. So verse 41 is rather surprising. The Jews then murmured at him. <laughs> they weren't happy with that, right? Uh, is the Christian world today happy with that? No, if you, they're happy with their version of it. So didn't but, the largest so-called Christian denomination call it an anathema to believe that uh, the righteousness of Christ comes by faith alone? 
So they murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he said, I came down from heaven? And Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not amongst yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's the third time it made that promise. Three times. Three times. And uh, the Sadducees couldn't have been happy with that either, right? Because they didn't believe in the resurrection. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Now, prior, the gospel was administered by angels. So said Paul in the book of Hebrews. Now they will be taught of God. So who was standing in front of them? God. God. Every man, therefore, that has heard and has learnt of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, he has seen the Father. Verily I say unto thee, I say unto you, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. What an amazing promise, eh? I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread that comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Here he declares himself God again. Yes, absolutely. I am that bread. I am that living bread. And then the Jews strove amongst themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So they refused to make the spiritual application. They were thinking cannibalistically. Mm. <laughs> so then Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink the blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. There's the promise again. So flesh is death, but blood is life, because the life is in the blood. So Christ gives his blood mm -hmm. so that we might have life, and he dies in the flesh, to be raised up into eternal life. And because we believe in him, we can be raised up with him if we are prepared to die to self. Yeah. That is what it amounts to. Now, Martin, what does this mean that you must eat the flesh? He says in verse 55, For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now, let's just get a, another verse in the Bible to bring this into some context. I want to read Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Just mull that one over. And let's just turn back to the very first verse in the Gospel of John. And we should all yeah. know that one. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the word here in my Bible in the King James is capitalized. Mm. 
So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jeremiah said, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So what is the purpose of eating the flesh of the Son of God and drinking the blood? Internalizing his word. Internalizing his word. Now, Martin, in today's world, people are inclined to rely on experience. Mm. Experiential religion. It has uh, to feel good. It you has to feel to... good religion. Not only that, I am led by the Spirit. Mm. Mm. Now, the Spirit never works separate from the Word of God. Uh, if you take Catholicism, which believes in the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola, which is totally divorced from the Word because it is based on a spiritual experience. Now, let's rephrase that, a spiritualistic mm. experience, which could be the voice of demons. It is, because if you go to the, in the past, there's been situations like in 1988, those people that had for five years all these experiences with angels, and eventually the angels told them to get rid of some of the other members in their Bible study group. Yes. Because they were a threat to the group. So you can be so indoctrinated by an experience that you even think that murdering somebody can be good. Well, doesn't the Bible say that eventually this power that is called Babylon will turn upon God's people and make laws to eradicate them yeah. Isn't that exactly the same thing that is going to happen on a universal scale that happened here in a mini scale? Exactly. And they are going to think that by experience they're doing the will of God. Okay. They're doing God a favor. So let's make it quite plain and state it categorically. If you want to eat the flesh and drink the blood, in other words, if you want to internalize the life of Christ and his character in you, where must you start? Yeah. In the Word. In the Word. All right? What was the battle about mm. in the Reformation? About the Word of God. About the Word of yes. God. The war raged about the Word of God. It was a conflict between the flesh and the blood of Christ, the Word of God, internalizing the Word of God, a thus says the Lord, as opposed to human laws, and traditions. And then it's so important to just reiterate the real truth, the real word of God. That's why we always bring up these episodes that just have to put it back into. Now, the people, the people in the time of Christ wanted signs and wonders. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, you will have no miracles, no signs, except the sign of Jonah. You will see there was a death and there was a resurrection. That's the sign of Jonah. Right? He was in the belly of the, of the ground and he rose from the dead. So here in the end, we will only have one safe God. And that is the word of God. Yeah. We dare not trust our feelings. No. We dare not trust our emotions. Emotions are fine in their right place. If they're an outflow of your as long as it's in harmony with in the word. Peace. This is the basis. This was the basis of Martin Luther. If it wasn't in the scripture, then he was not going to be convinced. And he said, it is not good to go against your conscience. So if you have a religion that is experiential, that tells you that the spirit tells you that something can be done that is contrary to this word, then it is a lying spirit. If the Christian world says that the Sabbath is not important and the Bible just told us that how important it is, then it is a lying spirit. So this is a very, very important issue. Now can you see why chapter 6 is so important? It takes us back to the word. 
takes you back to where your basis has to come from. Your anchor is in the Word, which reflects Jesus. Yes. Now, interesting, Martin, that the, the people that listened to this, they weren't overly excited, right? And so we read in verse 59, These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying, who can bear it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that I speak to you, the Bible, the Word of God, Old Testament, the Gospel in type and shadows, the New Testament, the Gospel in verity. And the result is verse 66. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Mm. Martin, another question. How many people in today's world, when you confront them with the issues in the word, do the same thing? From that day, they walked no more yeah. on this road. And the It is a hard thing. It is a hard thing. And the problem is, they go back to a road that they think is the one leading to the, to, to the heaven. Yes, but it doesn't. Because there's only one way. And he's the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. And his words are the ones that are to determine what is the way of truth and life. Oh, that's so important. So no pastor, no, nothing else but the word of God. Jesus tells you what he requires of you. Correct. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Mm. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So at this point, the disciples say, there is no other way. Where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What? There's no other way. It's either that or death. That's how important the choice is. And one of them is the devil. So we can expect some fireworks in the times that are ahead. So that's the basis of chapter 6 and why it is so important and why here at the end we need to be word-based. We need to understand the mission. We need to understand Isaiah 58. We need to understand Daniel's prophecy in relation to the prophecies in Revelation. And we need to find these things from the word and not from some human devising. Show me in the Word. All right, Martin, we're not going to go into any great detail in the other chapters. We want to come to the crux of the message, which is chapter 13. Just interesting things in chapter 7. In verse 17, Jesus says, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. It's a very interesting statement. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. So is it a prerequisite if you want to understand the doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of salvation? Mm -hmm. Is obedience a prerequisite? Yes. yes. If will. any man will do his will. Then you'll understand. Then you will understand the doctrine. That's when the doors open. And that's the not thing. Before. So once you once you um, continually criticize, for instance, the Sabbath, if you start keeping it, you will see it differently. Yes. That's what he's promising you here. So give it a chance. Give it a chance. 
Chapter 8 deals with uh, the adulteress. And that's also an interesting, very interesting uh, little chapter because spiritual adultery mm. is, is a very prominent factor amongst people that profess to be followers of Christ, right? And followers of God. So here is a, a fascinating portion of Scripture where these people bring this woman caught in the very act. And a woman, spiritually speaking, is a church, right? Yeah. And Jesus writes in the sand. It's fascinating to me that nowhere do you ever read that Jesus wrote something, except with his finger, right? Yes. Now, where did he write with his finger before? On the tables of stone. On the tables of stone. So, you know, all of these fine little nuances. Martin, people who say that this is, this is a human book of human devising, nobody, nobody can think up all of these no. fine little connections. It is an inexhaustible book. And... Uh, what was the attitude of the woman that was caught in adultery? She had repentance. She was, she she was, was remorseful. Yeah. And she was quiet and she was humble and she knew that she was guilty. And he forgave her. And he said, go and sin no more. <laughs> so, you know, there's hope and there's, there's such beautiful things. Chapter 9 to me is also a very fascinating chapter where this man who was born blind and was blind from birth was healed. And, you know, this is such a fascinating chapter. And the disciples asked, who has sinned, this man or his parents? <laughs> we always want to find the blame, right? Why did this thing happen to you, etc.? And Jesus says, neither had this man sinned nor his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then he does something fascinating. When he had spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay hmm. of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. That's fascinating. It's again like the bread that was given to the disciples and then to the multitude. So the works of God were to be made manifest in him. Mm -hmm. And then you must go. All right. Now, here's this a very interesting nuance he made clay yeah and he anointed the eyes because the man was blind now we think spiritually he was also spiritually blind mm. and then it applies to all of us because all of us are spiritually blind from birth yep from birth now when did he mold clay on a previous occasion at the creation of Adam. And Eve, of Adam. Uh, doesn't the Bible say all things were created by him Actually. and without him was not anything created? So who was the creator? Jesus. Jesus. And he took clay. And that was the original creation of humanity. Now he takes clay again mm -hmm. and he anoints the eyes. That's a symbol of recreation. That's it, yeah. So here's the creator God taking clay and anointing the eyes. In other words, recreating the spiritual eyesight. Mm. And he sends him to a pool, which is called Siloam, which means to be sent. In other words, he was to be a messenger. Mm. Now, who was he sent to? Because it said to him, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So you have to have spiritual eyesight. You need to have a recreation, and then you need to wash. Mm. So you have to 
You have to, he had a mini baptism. That's here. it. You have to wash away. You have to die that old death and have a resurrection. And then, like the woman in the previous chapter, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Even though this wasn't because of his sin that he was blind. Yes. And so he was sent to the Pharisees, right? And they were overjoyed to see a man that had been born, <laughs> born blind, <laughs> that he should now suddenly see and come and teach them something. Were they overjoyed? No, not at all. They were furious. Absolutely furious. Wasn't this done on the Sabbath as well? Yes. Now, this miracle, Martin, was obviously done on the Sabbath day because in verse 16 they say, Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a great division amongst them. Martin, does the message that people are sent with, that is rooted in the Bible, create great division? Yep. How many lives have been lost because of this message? And so they wouldn't believe him, and so they called his parents. And his parents were afraid of them, so they said, why don't you ask him? So they asked him again. <laughs> they shouted at him, are you trying to teach us? This man was a sinner, and he says, whether he was a sinner or not, <laughs> I cannot tell. One thing I know, I was blind and now I see. And they were furious. So the man answered and said unto them, in verse 30, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that you know not from whence he is, and yet he has opened up mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth no sinners, but if any man be a worshipper of God and doeth his will, he may hear it. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin, then dost thou teach us? Hmm. Martin, do we have similar situations where people suddenly discover truth in the world and they go to the minister and the pastor and they say to him, well, what do we do about this? And they say, who are you? Are you educated in the schools of... <laughs> well, did you study Greek and Hebrew? And did you do all of these things? Do you want to come and teach us now? You're not a no theologian. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. And then it says, they cast him out. All right, let's draw a parallel. In the times that we are living in, if you go and you confront someone with the word of God and they refuse to listen to it, if the blindness has been taken away and you are sent with the message, the likelihood that they will cast you out is very high. It right? is. Because they cast out Jesus as well. So They will cast you out. Okay. So they would not ac accept the correction. They said, Dost thou teach us? And then Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe in the son of, on the Son of God? It's an interesting question. So just, let's just recap there. Did this man at any stage up until this point see Jesus? No. No. No, he did not even know who was the man. But he received him. a spiritual eyesight. He became a witness for Christ. He started witnessing. Then he was cast out. Now, he could have felt very rejected. Did Jesus leave him in that state? No. He came and met him right there. There's a beautiful promise there, right? So when this happens to you, then Jesus will come to you and he say, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. That's pretty straight. In other words, Martin, if you have received your spiritual eyesight and you are prepared 
to witness on behalf of what you have received, and you receive persecution mm -hmm. as a consequence, will you then see Christ? Yes, he will reveal himself to you. He will reveal himself. Didn't it say that uh, if you do the will of God, you will know of the doctrine? That's it. Mm -hmm. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. So what must Jesus be if he worshipped him? God. Correct. Only God. Only God. So how is it possible that in this world that we are living in, people deny the divinity of Christ? Mm. Unbelievable, right? It's unbelievable, but it, it's they don't want what God, what he is providing. Yes. They want what they want. Now this issue of Jesus being God is highly contested in the world today, but it is very clear in the Gospel of John. And it is reiterated over and over and over again. Did Jesus rebuke this man because he, because he worshipped him? No, not at all. In no. fact, just before that, he says, it is I. You, you've seen him and it is him speaking to you. Yes. So Jesus is in the fullest sense God. Chapter 10, there is a dispute or discussion between Jesus and uh, the Jewish people. And he says in verse 17, Therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Must he be God in order to do that? He can only be God. Okay. He be doing that. Then he says it quite plainly. He says in verse 30, I and my father are one. Mm. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou being a man makest thou God. Makest thyself God. So did they understand what Jesus was saying? Yes. They were not okay. they acknowledged that he mentioned that he is God. He is God. And they understood it as such. And they denied it, right? So this required one final super proof that they could not deny. Mm -hmm. He said, I am the resurrection. I lay down my life. I take it up again. I and the Father are one. And they were furious because he was making himself God. And then in chapter 11, you have the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. This is indisputable proof that he is God. Because he's the one who calls Lazarus forth out of the grave. And what did the Jews want to do to Lazarus as a consequence? Then they wanted to kill him as well. Now, does that surprise you? No. As soon as you do the will of God and you acknowledge that Jesus is God, Satan wants to kill you as well. So this is a pattern that we find in humanity. Hmm. We find this pattern that there is a resistance to the truth and particularly a resistance to the truth as it is in Jesus. Mm. And you can take all the big religions of the world. Catholicism denies the atonement. Islam denies the atonement. The Jews deny the atonement. And the other religions of the world have no need of an atonement. So the big issue is really the position of Jesus Christ. That's it. It's always been. Even the great controversy started like that in heaven. That was the big final proof that Jesus gave of his power and his divinity. And the lesson is there for all to study. And now we come to the portion 
where Jesus is about to depart from this world. And he has a final message of instruction for his disciples. Mm -hmm. A very important message for their ears only. And it starts with the story of the Last Supper, which we read about in chapter 13. And then Judas departs. Mm -hmm. And then in chapters 14 to 17, we have this final instruction which we need to internalize. We need to eat this flesh and drink this blood so that we can stand in the days that are coming. So this important issue we will discuss in our next episode. Yeah, yeah. so we'll definitely have, because it's going to take quite a time. Yes. Because this is so important. This is very important. This has got to do with what we are going through right now, and this message is for us, Correct. just as much as it was for the disciples. So let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you have given us the words of life. You have told us to internalize them, to eat the flesh and to drink the blood. And Lord, if we do thy will, you have promised that we shall know of the doctrine. We also pray that you will anoint our eyes with clay and recreate our spiritual eyesight, which has been blind from birth. We thank you, Lord, that you are the resurrection and the life and that you are who you claim to be and that it is right for us to worship you. Bless us as we go our way and be with us as we come together again to discuss this great plan of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.